Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is George White, the CEO and co-founder of Headlight, previously Pavia Systems. Headlight, founded in 2005, is a photo-based inspection technology that provides a visual source of truth about infrastructure projects. They've raised over $32 million in funding, including a $25 million round that they just recently closed. Their current clients include state departments of transportation, top-tier engineering firms, contractors, and industry-related materials companies from across the U.S. Welcome, George. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Of uh, course. Good to see you. Good to see you virtually in these, uh, <laughs> this new world. But, so we uh, like to say, we play a drinking game in our house where we say unprecedented, and every time that word comes up anywhere, we're like, drink? That word is love, so overused. I love it. You guys must yeah. not make it more than uh, 30 or 40 minutes then. <laughs> exactly. I know. So, okay, we're going to start the podcast with rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Rapid round. Okay. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Uh, probably more of an extrovert. What is the best concert that you've ever attended or one that you haven't that you would love to go to? Uh, funny enough, actually, the one that always jumps in my head first is the very first concert I went to. And I was, uh, I was a young man, uh, very young, actually. I was like 14. And it was Dire Straits oh, at nice. the old Coliseum. Oh, yeah. And, That's a uh, good first concert. It was. It was. It was an exciting adventure. I smelled things that I had never smelled before at that time, and I uh, went with my folks, actually, but it was, a, um, it was a great experience. I still remember it, and then we ended up seeing like um, you know, them and the Stones and things like that afterwards, so kind of fortunate to have that in the collection these days. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I know you're a wine connoisseur. What is your favorite blend or um, what's your favorite wine? Um, great question. I actually... I wouldn't say I have a favorite. Um, Are you really red or white? I'm, or is it depending on the weather? It really mood? depends what I'm doing and yeah. what I'm eating. Uh, so I love, uh, I mean, if it's a, a day drinking affair, you know, you might want some, some white or, or some rosé. Hopefully it's a nice day out. Yeah. Um, but then with food, uh, definitely love Syrahs. Um, things that really help complement food. I like wines that have a little acid or a little, you know, structure to them. Yeah. Um, but definitely enjoy that. Do you, well, we'll get into it later because this is our rapid fire and I'm going, I'm going to go off, off on this like wine thing later. Um, okay. What is your dream vacation? You're like bucket list vacation. Bucket list vacation. Without kids. <laughs> oh, without kids. Um, well, you could do both. I just went like, uh, maybe you want to do it with your kids. You can. Totally. Uh, that's a great question. Um, actually probably going over with my wife and, uh, making camp, um, you know, we've, we've each done different parts of like Europe, um, but at the same time, just go stay over there for like a month, two months, three months, whatever, and then go cruise around. I like to spend a long time in a place, so you get to know like the people a little bit more intimately. I remember I went with a buddy to Bali, and we stayed basically with some villagers for like a week, and uh, I, I got my first experience going to a, a cockfight, um, because you know those are illegal down there but uh you know we've made friends with the villagers and they they took us to these things and um so th those are always my favorites when you get to kind of immerse yourself and learn from the what the you know just kind of the local culture does yeah. so I, um uh, i think that'd probably be so europe so you'd want to go to like europe but stay for like two three months and yeah I'd go i heard you say the word camp so you'd want to like camp and like a tent no, let's not get that carried away. I do love camping, but, um, you know, make like, just make a base camp. So like, you know, pick a, oh, okay. and then, uh, do trips from there. I always like having like a place and then, you know, maybe go, uh, into the Eastern Mediterranean up in, you know, 
um, yeah, those types of areas. That'd be, it'd just be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, what, I can't wait till we're able to travel again. I definitely am missing travel during, during this, uh, unprecedented time drink. There you go. <laughs> drink. Uh, what is one habit that you are trying to break? Ooh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Um, probably my, my habit of what feels like lack of exercise lately. Um, mm. uh, I do a lot of walking and talking. So it's, we have a little competition here in the office, usually for steps and things, but. What's uh, the most steps you've gotten in a day? Um, about 12 miles is probably about 12 and a half just on a work day. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and wait, how many steps is that? Uh, it's about 20,000, something like that. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. That's super hardcore. Yeah. Well, it, it, it happens faster than you think just walking around the neighborhood. Although I'm sure a lot of my neighbors these days are like, who's that weird guy that just keeps walking by? Yeah. You're like, you're like a creeper. Yeah. I'm the, I'm the creeper in the neighborhood, but it's funny. They all, uh, you know, all of our neighbors, we all have a pretty good relationship. So they're like, oh, George is uh, on the yeah. phone working. There goes George. Yep. Yeah, no, I think that's good. They, uh, there's a lot of people who love to walk and talk and I try to do it. It's so good. So what, um, what one word would your friends use to describe you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> there might be kids listening. I know. Hopefully I would, they would say, something along the lines of, uh, you know, gracious or warm or welcoming, something of the, I, the perfect word is, is escaping me at the moment, but. Um, warm I, is a good one. Yeah. I would love to be described like that. Like that to me, like you're the person who's um, inclusive and yeah. And yeah, fun. Yeah. You know, um, I, it's important. I remember the first time I met you, I got really good energy from you. You do have a very warm personality and I feel like you're always smiling. I would not want to see you angry. I can't even picture it. It, it does happen, <laughs> believe it or not. And my kids have definitely uncovered that side of me at times, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I think generally I'm a, a, a grateful and enjoy every day. I mean, what else are we going to do? So uh, yeah. It's hard not to, but, but there are things that uh, I'll say I get extremely irritated and I can be very crisp, um, but move, yeah. but move, move past it pretty fast. Pretty I, quickly. I, well, that's good. I'm not a grudge. You're not person. holding any grudges. That's good. No. Is there anything that you've read, seen, or listened to that has helped shape your life or define your thinking? You know, I wouldn't say that shaped or defined my thinking, but you know, one of the things that I really enjoy doing and I do whenever I'm commuting, um, besides listening to, you know, different radio and podcasts, um, uh, I love listening to TED Talks. Um, mm. I just love listening to people's ideas and hearing what they're thinking. Um, and just from all different perspectives, like even in today's well, about hyper polarized news and information, I actually like still listening to everybody's point of view and then trying to formulate my own. So it's like, I don't think I necessarily listen to something to shape what I'm thinking, but I do like trying to understand as many points of view that are out there. And then, yeah, then I usually chart a course and then think I'm, yeah, I'm the same way. I was actually just having um, dinner with someone last night and we were talking about perspective and how divisive things are right now and how I actually do like to surround myself with people, not, not jerks, but people who have different ideas yep. and different perspectives. Oh yeah. Because that's the way that I like to learn is through listening and through conversation. Um, so I love that answer. That's, that's totally how I, I work also. So tell me about you, because we met as you're, you know, we're fully formed adults at this point. Right. But if we were kids yep. together, like who were you as a kid? Like what was your childhood like? Um, great childhood. I'm an only child, believe it or not. So you are, I am. Yep. I didn't know that part. Cause I couldn't find it when I did a little research and I was like, in my mind, I had this picture of you coming from this huge, and maybe it's your warmth. I pictured this whole huge family and big dinner table conversation. That's funny. Only child, huh? No, only child actually. And, and very small. Like it was really just my folks, um, you know, and myself. And then you know, I didn't have a lot of relatives even and other things around uh, when we grew up. So it was really, you know, hanging out. And then a lot of times, you know, you're kind of the kid that's hanging out with 
a group of adults. And so you certainly get exposed and mature, I think, a little bit faster being exposed to a lot of that very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but I was probably the kid that I ran with, uh, I ran with kids that played sports. I ran with kids in the band. I ran with the kids in AP calculus. Like I kind of was the, would run with all the different groups and, um, and even the kids that when we were up to no good, I, I certainly was a part of that, but yeah. Um, you know, I was, a uh, definitely, I loved, uh, you know, learning and doing the school thing, but, um, also playing quite a bit. My grandma always, you know, it's a common phrase, but she always said, work hard, play hard. So I probably, yeah. probably try to live those ideas. Oh, I like your grandma. That's, that's like my motto. I love her. Yeah. So where were you raised? Uh, just here outside of Seattle, uh, in Redmond. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, born and raised there and then, uh, went to the University of Washington after that. Um, How did you decide to go to UW? I, I've got to tell you a little bit more of the story to help bring it into yeah. full, but it's because like as a kid, I always wanted to be actually an electrical engineer. Like that was like, I loved doing these little experiments and stuff when I was a kid, and even through high school and all this stuff. And so even as I got through high school, uh, I was like, okay, I think I want to be an engineer. I, I love attacking and learning and, and building things like particularly love building things so it was like okay cool and so then it was looking at schools um where that might be applicable um and certainly UW looked at UW my both my parents and even my wife everybody went to wazoo um just sort of footnote there uh, double thumbs down <laughs> but uh so actually one of the th there's a couple schools that I liked in Colorado Boulder and then uh, inside of uh, Golden, there's a school called Colorado School of Mines, which was like a very just engineering school. Mm -hmm. And so I remember we went there, uh, my mom and I, in, I don't know, junior year to kind of go check out different schools. And then the, the coolest thing, you know, Colorado School of Mines, it's in the same, you know, town as Coors Brewery. So you're like, oh, this is, this could be good. But it was like culturally, like, I was like, because I ran with so many different groups, I started to realize that, you know, while I love the the work aspect, the, the play aspect, I didn't feel was there. And so then I went over to Boulder and was like, wow, this is a lot of fun, um, you know, not seeing some of the other things. And and I kind of had the same experience actually going and checking out schools in, in Washington. I went to uh, UW. I ended up having just a, a great time every time I visited there. And knew they had a good program and probably unfortunately for my parents the, the time that we went to wazoo um just happened to be a completely dead weekend and i remember yeah. telling them i'm like is there anything in town that's bigger than the this tire shop here because i'm not seeing it and uh so i guess i was born more of a, a city and active kid and wanting to see stuff and then it basically came down to um when it looked at you know how to pay for school and things it made didn't make a whole lot of sense to to leave the state um of course it's such an extreme difference oh, yeah. in cost so and UW's a great school i mean what a fabulous education right oh it was, it was it was outstanding i uh yeah i ended up actually um working my way through school by writing software for there's a research ship uh, that the University of Washington has, um, you know, that goes out like the kind that go and find like the Titanic and things like that. Um, and so I would basically moonlight both doing night watch and writing software for them, uh, you know, to help pay for school. Um, and that was, that's really where my mindset shifted from, um, like funny enough, I ended up with the mechanical engineering degree but it was one that specialized in computer electrical mechanical. And so it sort of brought, yeah. brought those little pieces together, which was nice. Wait, so this is an embarrassing question because I've been recruiting for like a long time, 26 years. I do a lot mm -hmm. in um, obviously software development and engineers, but what's the difference between electrical engineering and mechanical engineering? So electrical engineering, uh, the way I would describe it uh, is you're doing, it's, it's a very math, focused and you're you know whether you're dealing with high voltage things like uh you know the power that's distributed amongst our infrastructure or low voltage things like computers or designing circuit boards 
Um, it's really math and design oriented. And what I discovered was I, you weren't seeing a lot of action and things happen. Mm. And then mm. why I liked the mechanical side was like you were doing some things and, and things were, everything was very dynamic. Um, you know, it's the, we were doing like flight controls for airplanes, like the autopilot, you know, stuff like that, where everything's moving and you could see things happen a little bit more tangibly. Um, and then of course, you know, get the degree there. And then uh, as luck would have it, uh, after I graduated, you know, one of the professors that I worked with in mechanical engineering was like, hey, I know these couple guys over in civil engineering that are, you know, trying to figure out why potholes are being formed and they need someone to help them, you know, build some software in a database. Um, do you want to, you know, he knew I was moonlighting and stuff. He's like, you want to go do that? Okay. That's how, is that the whole birth story? So that's it. Yeah. That's, that's there's the birth. So then, um, yeah, basically went, uh, uh, was doing the moonlight project with the <sighs> professors there at the UW and, um, one of them there who's probably been the most influential on on my life in terms of kind of the direction it ended up taking um his name's uh joe mahoney he he's like hey i know you're doing the software but so you understand that i, I want to take you out on a couple of these um construction sites so you can actually see what's happening um and man he knew how to hit the you know give you that first first hit for free because once i got out there um and saw like the magnitude and scope of the materials, all these things moving around. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was hooked. So, um, so tell me the history. problem that you were, were solving and what the business model was when you first started the business. Well, so when we first started the business, so the initial, I mean, and to some degree, the same core thing exists is like the infrastructure. Um, it's one of those things that I think, a lot of us, I certainly did before, take for granted in terms of, uh, you know, it's really, when we talk, we, we say infrastructure, or at least when I do, you know, I think about, it's the the roads and bridges that connect us. The Yeah, that's how I think of it. Yeah, the energy, the water, wastewater, like when you turn on your faucet, when you go to the bathroom, those are all infrastructure um, that provides that connective and allows us to do that. And so... For me, seeing the sort of the magnitude and scope of that was was like, wow, this literally touches everyone's lives on the planet and is so foundational to um, really being a functioning society. Like, I, mm -hmm. I want to have a piece of that. Um, you know, I, for me, and, and again, I'm obviously biased, but, you know, you look at the big things, education, healthcare, all those things, kind of the glue that, in my mind, that brings them together is an infrastructure that either even you and I communicating right now is because there's some fiber wires that have been laid in the infrastructure that's connected it. And uh, so in learning more about that, what you, what you discovered was, or at least what really hooked me was that, you know, when I buy a car, I have like a, you know, hundred thousand mile 10 year warranty on the car or whatnot. Right. And like, as we're building these big pieces and it just so happened at the time, there was a bunch of road and bridge failures that were happening that were just getting a lot of press. And what I learned was that, um, you know, when we build these things, they're supposed to last 40, 50, 60 years. Um, they don't come with any warranties. And so, you know, just started to like poke at that and like, well, why not? Like, why couldn't you do that? What's the, um, what's the driving factors around that? And so, you know, started to learn basically more about the process that um, happens there. And, and that's where really the opportunity that we started to plug into. So the business problem was how do you help these owners of these large connective tissue type assets uh, ensure that they're literally building and getting what they pay for and, and that it's built to last? And, mm -hmm. and the tools that they were and, and actually in a lot of places continue to use to do that um, are ones that are, you know, very arcane and don't provide the right feedback. So it's, uh, you know, that, that was the, the problem we wanted to get in and tackle because we knew, you know, I, I learned this too. They spend, you know, we spend like $5 trillion a year across the planet on just 
building and maintaining this stuff. And so mm -hmm. you can imagine economically, you can make a huge impact if you can um, uh, make that process more um, efficient and longer lasting. And then uh, just even from a life standpoint, we've seen like in our country, I don't know if you ever, there's this American Society of Civil Engineers and they give a report card for like infrastructure. And if you ever see those headlines. I don't even want to know if I want to see that. Oh, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it, it uh, I don't, I definitely don't think I want it, to see that. That's, it's like a D plus, you know, you're like, but yeah, it, but, I was going to say like, yeah, you know, and it's like when you see the, those, the tragedies, we've seen them already, like with the bridge failures. So the worst part is those people are getting, there's people that are getting hurt and killed. And that's to my, in my mind, totally preventable. And, and then you compound that by the, the impact that that just had to probably millions of people that were using that mm -hmm. infrastructure. So, so we work to help um, manage and, and prevent those things through mm -hmm. processes of inspection. And so how does that, how does that inspection work and how is that different today than it was when you started it in 2005? Totally. So in 2005, um, it was a very different, I guess, technological world. We didn't have um, all the mobile devices and other things that we do now. So like when we started, we had this idea like, hey, how do we equip the workers in the field with the knowledge that they need to know so that they can make the right decisions as well mm -hmm. as the data and information so that they're making sound decisions off good information. And so that was kind of the two pronged approach. And actually when we started the business, what really took off was providing the knowledge and education. And so we were doing, which at the time was fairly novel, um, you know, e-learning online certifications for the people in the field to make sure that they were equipped with the right knowledge you know, should they be presented the right information? Um, so that actually the bit that really was what drove the business initially. Um, you know, we just were bootstrapped, kind of grew it organically. Um, and it really wasn't until, you know, 2009, 2010, you know, when uh, the smartphone came out in, uh, you know, 2008, 2009, it started becoming more prevalent and being in more and more of our users' pockets that we could truly kind of bring in that part of the vision of how do we enable, you know, a process which, you know, you're asking how it is today. They're literally writing, you know, it's like, you know, back in elementary school and we used to write notes and then you pass it, you're like, hey, pass it to the girl mm -hmm. three seats down, and, you know, and you hope, yeah. like, and now they're just texting Hope it back. gets to her and yeah. not like telephone. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It, that, that's what they're, you know, primarily we're doing. And so instead we're, we're kind of bringing the, the tools to do that instantaneously. And, and our, our big thing is to do it objectively. So we, everything, we do a lot of work in the visual space. So capturing moments in time, visually, cameras, videos, you know, your mobile those types of things. And so when someone's out in the field and they're using your technology, mm -hmm. walk me through, like now I'm a person and I'm out in the field. Yeah. Give me an example of how that's used. Yeah. So if you're a inspector, so on these jobs, you, there's inspectors where their job is all day, every day to go out and observe, you know, how things are being built, the materials that are being used, uh, and the quantities that are being placed so that they can ensure all the, you know, they're giving themselves the best chance for success in the long term. Um, so an inspector, like before, would literally, they carry around these little, like, notebooks, they'd be jotting stuff down here and there. And then at the end of the day, they go, um, usually, you know, drive back to an office, uh, key it up in, like, a Word document or something like that into a big, you know, narrative and then they'll hand that up to the professional engineer um, who usually gets it the next day or two uh, that can read and see what activities were going on and if there was any issues. So you can imagine, I mean, I could bore you with the number of cases, you know, where you might lay $2 million worth of road before you figure out you had a problem, you know, because the information is just not flowing. And so with Headlight, they're literally out there with a mobile device. Uh, a lot of our users use iPads just because it's got a better you know, screen real estate. And you, literally, like, they walk out, they uh, can just tap it to make a few observations, you know, photo, boom, boom, boom. 
Mm -hmm. And as they're doing it, we have a technology that it applies. Um, it's metadata, but think of it as just like easy labels and tags. So almost like in the Twitter okay, world, got so it. it's like hash. So it, rec it recognizes what it is. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. And it attributes it to a work element or a pay element so that, okay. so that they can then quickly put all that information together. And as they're doing that, you know, the the professional engineer or the project can like log in and see anything. Yeah, they can see that stuff in real time. So it's, you know, so that happens. And then there's all these other compliance things you need to do for environmental, um, uh, safety, labor and compliance, you know, there's just different mm -hmm. workflows. And so the technology helps, mm -hmm. helps those folks. Yes. And so what's the business model? Um, how do you get paid? Uh, we, we basically get paid um, really as a, uh, you can think of it ultimately by the owners. Um, sometimes that mm -hmm. might come by way of an engineering firm or a contractor, basically one of their partners. Um, mm -hmm. But if you think about it right now, like uh, if I wanted to go build a road and it was my road, um, what I would do before headlight is about one out of every $10 I spend, I would hand over to my inspector and say, can you make sure they do everything right? And so what we do is we're able to really reduce the, that dollar that they have to hand over that 10%. Um, and so our, our business model is really, it's a, it's a subscription model, um, but it's fundamentally based on the construction value. So if you're going to place $10 million, then, you know, we would get a very, very small fraction of that project. Um, but there's it's a win-win because they're saving oh yeah. money, you're making it's, a lot of money. And then what about from a liability standpoint? Totally. Is that a component of it? Yeah, no, totally. You nailed it. And that's a huge, huge component. I mean, look, you know, here downtown, the, you know, we've got that huge, uh, the Big Bertha tunnel, and there's there's going to be a lot of money shed on that one, one way or another. And it's... And are they going to use your, your technology for that? The uh, parts of it. Um, this particular one was uh, the project started before we deployed here, which was like, uh, you know, yeah. We, but yeah, because uh, you look at it and you're like, that's no yeah, way now. No, yeah, exactly. But uh, but there are others here and, and examples there where um, there, there's a lot of cases where you want that objective information to help with claims and mitigation. Mm -hmm. You know, so when uh, something goes awry, um, you know, previously it. it it's really when you have a few written words or maybe no words, it's really then it's a, a lot of uh, lawyers getting paid to to shift things. But I, I've literally yeah. been in meetings where they've pulled up a picture from headlight and it's been with like a, a supplier of some product and the owner. And then the supplier's like, oh, geez, well, there you go. Like, you're right. Let's fix this and let's work together. So, yeah, the, the goal would be to make it more of a partnership. Like, everybody, I, I would say by and large, most people have a great intent to build the greatest things. And um, the more open and objective you can make the issues that happen, it's kind of, I liken building infrastructure to remodeling a house. Going yeah. through that process, like it's like, you know, they'll peel back some drywall and then they'll uncover something and then you'll get the phone call that's like, so we, I know we budgeted this for this part, but when we pulled this back, you really need to get, uh, some new electrical wiring back here. So we really recommend you do that because if you don't, you know, your house might burn down. And so, right. uh, you know, we're going to need an extra three grand. Um, yeah. So, you know, building, um, especially infrastructure where you're digging and you're uncovering a lot of unknowns, that happens a lot. And so the more objective information you can have, just the more, uh, the easier it is to to deal with those well, difficult it sounds situations. Like your business is like, it sounds like your business is an incredible efficiency for people. It's like, it, A, this is super efficient because we don't have to do the old antiquated clunky version. On top of it, it provides a lot of accountability. Yes. Because people know that there's like, this is just how it's going to be. We're going to own what we're, own our work. And then on top of it, it's it creates all sorts of safety. Like I feel better knowing. I'm like, yeah. okay, good. We're working like, on it. You guys are involved. That's great. So, what's the where's the business? Are you pleased with where it is and where where it's going? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, well, extremely excited about where we are, especially you know 
appreciate the, the little shout out, uh, you know, recent um, uh, partnership and fundraise with, with uh, Viking Global and bringing them in. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing is um, the, uh, the opportunity is huge. We've now validated uh, with a lot of key customers. We have a, a state, um, literally an entire state that's now standardized on the technology. Um, and so, you know, those things really demonstrate where we can go and now and the value. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, now it's really, um, you know, helping build the team and expand mm -hmm. our footprint. Like we're still just focused really in the U S and there's a lot of work to do there. Um, you know, but everything that we're doing is hyper applicable across the globe. Uh, anywhere. Yeah. yeah. In the world. Yeah. And so what was the fundraising process like at this stage? And cause I know Vikings, yeah incredible that huge huge congrats and that's a lot of money to raise is that how much you went into the fundraising process looking for or is that more um you know it was uh, a little more than we were looking for um but actually at the same time as we started looking at what we were trying to accomplish it's kind of one of those it, it became almost an iterative process so we talked we talked to a lot of different people um and i would liken the process to it's like speed dating and then you kind of walk towards marriage a little bit. And I think the thing that said I learned the most going doing this a couple of times now is really uh, just like building a business. That's the, the people that matter the most and like always finding good partners and people you will work through all the things. And like um, even the best deal on the table, if it's not with the right people is, is a terrible deal um, mm -hmm. on paper. And so you know, we were just really fortunate as we, were, we actually talked to a number of groups we were really uh, and moving forward with and excited about, but, you know, the group at Viking just really stood out. They were amazing. In fact, they had folks coming to some of our conferences and things like that. And I, I really uh, respected how their parts of how they approached the process. Lots of, dilig lots of diligence and relationship yeah. building. Yeah. And, and they took the time to really understand the business problem and the, what are the, opportunities what are the risks and and be mm -hmm. become a partner versus um you know have a, a you know we did encounter some that were very formulaic like well you know we have this sort of formula that we want to accomplish in a certain time frame you know, here's the playbook yeah here's the irr we want to get to our lps and all this other stuff and so you could just you could almost sense that coming out um from the beginning and so you know i think for us to make the impact that we the potential impact that we can, I think is enormous. And mm -hmm. uh, it, so I think share, having people that share that vision was, was really great. Yeah. And so how are you feeling as a leader, as you take this money and go kind of take your business to the next level? Um, are there, are there values that you've set as a company and um, yeah. what was that process like? coming up with those values? How did you determine? No, that, that's a great question. And actually a, a process that we recently went through, like when we initially started the company, you know, Cy and I kind of outlined some of that stuff together um, and it sort of carried us through for a while. But then as we transitioned and really pivoted uh, with, you know, around Headlight and our team started growing, uh, when we hit about, it was about 30, 35 folks, um, just recently, like the executive team, which has grown, obviously, uh, there's four of us and some of the board members we got together. Um, we had done, gotten some feedback from employees and things. And it was kind of like, hey, let's revisit, you know, how we want to show up every day. Now that we're getting bigger, we've got, it's not just, a, a, you know, one layer of people. And so that we can start to be more of a values driven organization so that, you know, uh, I always believe if, if folks have the right and, you know, good intent and have the right values and approach to it, well, that then we'll be in good shape. And so, mm -hmm. um, so we went through this big exercise and basically came up with, um, what we now call our operating principles. Um, there's some core values underneath that, but they're, they're really things like um, that we can also use as reminders of how we like to show up. Um, so like a, a great one that 
and again, this is actually, we didn't invent the playbook here. Like we, like any, any good organization, you beg, borrow and steal from, from others that have had great ideas. And uh, so, so we came up with the list and we've been socializing them and w within the company, we started just socializing them first and seeing how people were responding and everything. And then, uh, and then we started implementing a couple of things like within Slack and other things where we could start to recognize them. And, and really what you're trying to see is like, are we living our values? Like, Totally. So the process, the process for you guys um, was also, you know, as you say, like living them internally, but it, they can also be used and be really helpful as you recruit. Oh, totally. And as you start to build your team to have some sort of talking points like, hey, John, you're going to press on efficiency and totally. Susie, you're going to press on kind of accountability. And no, we, we try to do that. And it's helpful because you can, you can use those. And then also for difficult conversations when you're like, Hey, you weren't living our values in this way, almost like a marriage counselor, like a third party, like the values service. I a hundred percent agree. I love that. And, and that's a, uh... Like even now in our interview process, we have people that are assigned basically a couple of those to kind of suss out. Um, yeah, like that Amazon like bar yeah. raiser type of way that there's someone in there just in there to measure for values. And yeah, that totally makes sense. One of sense. ours is uh, love problems, not solutions. And, uh, you know, because yeah. as a software company solution provider, like sometimes even internally, I I'm guilty of this, you know, where you have an idea and a salute, you're like, hey guys, let's all do this. And then, you know, but everyone's like, well, like the fix it guy versus yeah, but, the process. Or, or just like, like, why are we doing that? What was the problem we're trying to solve again? And it's funny. It now shows up. I literally I was in a meeting earlier this morning with a customer where one of our folks was like, uh, we're, we're talking with a customer who was really adamant about us adding a feature. Right. And they're like, this is the right solution. And, and the person was like, Hey, that's, that's a great idea. Like, what we like to do here is really make sure we understand the problem first. And so can we back it up a notch and just make sure we're agreed That's on, so what the, on what the problem is. And so that um, one, it was awesome to see that, but it, you know, so I'm hopeful that we could use those in ways with our customers too, to be like, cause, cause people are totally. like, well, I, I do it my way. And you're like, okay, that's cool. But wait, back it up. You know, yeah, what problem are we actually yeah. solving here? And is that a good use of our time yep. and priority? So, yeah. It's helpful. So did you find them? What are your, what would we Operating call principles. Your operating yeah, principles to... or your values. It's okay if you don't have them. But I just, I think this is an interesting conversation for leaders. And especially during this um, time of COVID, it's an interesting time to try to show up as a leader and make sure that you are um, making all of this clear and being really it, intentional around it. Cause it's hard. You're like, we're all behind our zoom and it, you know, got the dogs and the kids and it, it is, you know, the one thing that's actually been at least what I've heard and observed for us, like, so we already were embracing like a telework culture. Um, previous to all this, we had Tuesday, Thursday, telecommute day. Um, you know, we're not a butts and seats kind of shop. If you know what I mean? Like a hey, nine to five, I want you in your, your seat. Um, yeah. It's more about get like the job done because that doesn't work for your industry. Yeah. And let's just, how, how do we just work together the best way we can to get things done? Yeah. And so we had, um, and we've got folks spread across the U S and so we, we would have, it was funny. We, we would have events or like happy hours or things like that, that, um, you at first didn't really realize, but like our Seattle office, you know, there's a majority of us are here. So we'd be enjoying those things, but then the remote folks kind of don't get to experience that as much. And yeah, it was kind of like, you know, I, I'd get a few comments of like, yeah, we, you know, it'd be great to participate in something like that, or maybe we could figure a way out. And um, so then when COVID hit and it was basically, you know, we were already kind of walking towards a very extremely flexible sort of where you work culture, you know, we kind of yeah. just jumped right in. And so now everybody's on Zoom and it's almost like an equalizer. And so I completely agree. And also it shows up as like, Hey, the expectation is at least for us, people know that I get neurotic. If I don't hear back from people, I get a little anxious, like, okay. And then when you feel like they're floating in never, never land, like I can't see your eyeballs. I don't know what's happening. I'm not assuming that they're like messing around and not working. It just creates a little bit more accountability in a different way. I think 
I agree. I'm reading your sign on your wall. The yes. little, it's the little details that are vital. Little things make big things happen. You got I it. I do like that. I'm trying to teach that to my kids. Like, we're trying to have them make their beds and clear yep. the dishes. And like, all of this creates a peaceful home. <laughs> No, it is. Uh, yeah, we have a few things in my house, and the, and the same here. It's just you kind of are what you eat, and that, and your values, and that. Um, this one, yeah. so we have a, a one of our operating principles is details matter, um, and this is a quote from John Wooden, the basketball coach. But uh, um, it's really just talking about, you know, it's usually those little things that you do, you say. Um, I like to call them the fundamentals of like people and just business and listening and all those things that like when somebody recognizes that you heard a little detail of something that they said and you reflect it back or, or you went that extra mile to write a little something, you know, there's those little details that end up making a really big difference. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, and help like anything, you know, you can build, build things that are truly delightful and enjoyed and, and, by that it could be a thing or it could be a relationship too. Like I, I, I got to get better with my, even with my wife, sometimes I get wrapped up and get busy. I, you know, I, I could think of details that I should be tending to with just little thank yous and little things for her that I probably don't do as much of as I should, you know, and it's just like mm -hmm. little things that it helps me remember like, wait, I got to, you know, it's great that you put that into your operating principles. Cause then you'll just like, remember that. And a lot of that is just, you know, as it relates to either your wife or, or your work, yeah. um, just doing, doing it right then and there versus I think sometimes people overthink these things. So it is true. Like even with employees, like just a little bit of that intention around that, I think makes a huge difference. Um, I like that you just went through this process. And so it, you'll apply it through your recruiting and as you grow. And right now you have 35 employees, you said? Uh, yeah, we're closing in on 40, actually. I should know wow. the exact number I know, but we just have an, I think we have an offer out today and, um, that's exciting. It's pretty close to 40. Yeah. That's exciting. So, so how do you feel about being the CEO of a company that's, you know, maybe down the road going to be upwards of a hundred employees? Does that, does that feel right to you? Feel good to you? Or does it feel like, whoa, I like to like know everyone and really know no, everything I, I, and honestly, how they work? Um, I, I feel great if uh, like we've got a, a great team. Um, and as we, you know, what's one of the cool things is like, we've actually hired a lot of people that have grown with the company. Oh, and that's like cool. rolled into leadership positions. Like we, yeah. we just have a, a great retention rate. And and honestly, um, that helps me sleep at night. There's nights I don't sleep, but I'm not a, uh, my approach is definitely not command and control and like need to know everything. I'd rather create a great environment that people can um, much Thrive smarter in. than me. Yeah, yeah. And just like, and, and I think the one of the hardest parts is really, and I think it starts with me too is helping show um, it's okay. That's even one of our values in terms of, you know, the fail fast is, which is a common mantra, but it, it really, you have to show, show it. And so by being as a leader, being vulnerable, you know, uh, you know, I've had to own up to some pretty big ones and, uh, and just what did I learn from it and using it as a mechanism there to both permeate the leadership team as well as everyone else so that we can be, you know, a, a a growing supportive group we've got big goals and objectives but um it's still going to be the people that get you there so yeah so yeah i, I would uh, imagine people love working with you like you just seem like a super reasonable cool dry hard driving but like um authentic type of leader like i i can totally see you being amazing at that that role how are you relaxing during this period of time you said you haven't been able to exercise you're walking not sleeping. Um, well, <laughs> well, I've been sleeping okay. Um, certainly, the one thing is my commute to do, uh, you know, some jumping on the trampoline with the kids or uh, things like that has been, you know, gone to zero. So that that's kind of awesome. Um, I definitely love. Uh, I've probably seen way too many, you know, you know, early teen movies lately with like my daughter and and son, and so um, definitely enjoy relaxing 
with them. Um, and then uh, I have gotten into a, a very odd habit of making like a, a craft cocktail at the end of the day. So oh, that, that's, that's been my good. Other. Did you, do you have masterclass? I don't. So masterclass is just like um, all these world experts on different subjects and um, they teach different lessons. It's an app. It costs like $150 a year. I actually sent it to everyone on my team so they could just stretch their oh, learning cool. and goals around. It's everything you could imagine from um, negotiating to basketball to painting to interior design. But one of them is craft cocktails. So my team has gotten into making craft cocktails. I am in. Masterclass. Oh my gosh, this yeah. is Masterclass. Okay, you'll I'm, love it. It's, it's all sorts of world happening. experts that you'll love. Yeah. Well, um, I always ask this at the end of my podcast, unless there's something we've not quite covered, but I'm just curious, what fuels you? Uh, so what gets me up in the morning? Is that, is that yeah, kind of like a, our legacy? Like the, people think of it in different ways. Some people think of it as like, what's my legacy or what, what am I, what, what drives you me? Know, yeah, that's a great question. And um, for me, it was actually something that I learned from my parents camping, which was the, you know, the old leave it cleaner than you found it. Cause I always remember we had to pick up three pieces of garbage, even if they weren't mine before we left the campsite. And, um, you know, I, for me, I, I get motivated. We're, we're here for such a short amount of time, like in the grand scheme of things, like I get excited looking at, you know, how big the world is and the universe and all that stuff. And, um, you know, I feel like, if I can get up every day and do something to leave it better for my kids, um, I'm good. I'm good with that. That gets me I going. I love that answer. I ask everyone. So I've gotten this answer from a lot of people. This is a good one. I want to like stamp that. I think it's incredible. Maybe you'd be a good burner at Burning Man. It's like leave no trace. Yeah, I, totally. And I have not been, but it sounds uh, like an amazing, have you been there? Yeah, I've been a couple times times that you you would be great there maybe that, that'll be on your bucket list once the once the covid pandemic is over let's yeah, do it that'd be good i'm you, in you can introduce me to it and then it'll, it'll <sighs> even be, more uh... fun i'd be thrilled to be there with you i'd be thrilled to be anywhere with you you're the best i'm so glad we got to do this thank you for making the time i know how busy you are and crazy and um i really appreciate it and it's fun to get to spend time together no likewise i i enjoy it and uh let's I'm going to go get my master class and then uh, let's yeah. make a cocktail. Send a picture together. of your of your cocktail. We could do it together. That'd be super fun. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, it's virtual cocktails these days. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, George. Go for a walk. <laughs> I'll okay, talk we'll to do. you later. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. And follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com to provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You.